I mean, the film ended in silence, and Kahn's last statement of philosophy was called Silence and Light. It's just a wonderful film. I've seen it maybe six or eight times, and each time it gets better and more powerful. And I'm intrigued by the revenge that Nathaniel gets in some cases. Uh, but um, there really isn't anything I can add to the film. I can't think of anything more to say about the film. Are any of you architects? Are any of you physicists? Okay, I can get away with murder then. Let's go. Any, any, any questions? Yes. Yeah. Working with Lewis Kahn, did he ever share with you a thread of his vision or who influenced him or how he wanted to incorporate nature and all those wondrous uses of space and light and, and geometrics. Did he ever talk about his intent, his, his vision? All of the above. Can you share any of all that with us? <laughs> share a little bit of that with us? Um, Robert Stern was wrong. He didn't force anybody to work till 3 o'clock in the morning. If you couldn't make it till 3 o'clock in the morning, you couldn't make it, but he didn't make you do it. You wanted to do it. Um, he was a guru for architects, and he was a guru for architects all over the world. His influence among students was worldwide. Um, in 64, I was in Caracas, Venezuela. I got a job teaching at the Central University of Venezuela. I was the only American, U.S. American, <laughs> there. It was run by the communists. The students controlled it. The faculty had to be approved. But I worked for Khan. And so he, from 11 o'clock till 3 o'clock in the morning, he did just that. And he was a teacher. And it was a, his office was an open classroom. Not that you would walk in from the street, but everybody who was there was, um, was a student. There were very few really experienced professionals in the office. Thank God, one or two. Everybody else was a student um, who ended up having enormous responsibility, like Jack McAllister, um, who went to Salk. Um, each of these projects ended up having one young person doing them. And what was, I think, the amazing thing, um, you might have gotten the impression from the film that Khan didn't do very many buildings, he couldn't keep clients. I don't think that was so. Many times the, 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 the staff at 2 o'clock in the morning, if Lou wasn't there, we'd sit around and spend an hour or two trying to figure out all the projects that hadn't been worked on in two or three months, right? Or the ones that nobody had heard about that he had taken, he had agreed to do. But he did everything. I mean, he did everything down to the last doorknob and the last detail. And, and the discussion on the doorknob went on as long as the discussion about where the building should go or which way it should face. So it was, it was an open book. And I think his fame and his influence was as a teacher. And in many cases, his ideas for the buildings were more powerful than the buildings actually were. Many people have been disappointed when they actually get to the building. <laughs> Let's see, this is the masterpiece everybody's talking about? I don't know what this is. But the idea was overwhelming. The idea was very powerful. And I think... And this was especially why I wanted to come to Princeton to, to mention this, because it's the right thing. I want to see C.K., who's an old friend who lives here. Um, because Albert Einstein was at Princeton. And I grew up near him. I grew up in Cranberry, or the, the other side of Cranberry. So this, was, this is sort of hometown um, in the 50s. And Albert Einstein was at Princeton. And there is an enormous connection, an enormous influence, if not stated, between Kahn and Einstein. Um, 
if you are an architect and you want to get to the bottom of things, if you want to start fresh and you want to, you know, know what you're talking about, you're interested in gravity. Buildings, you know, you've got to stand up. Gravity is something you want to know about. Uh, space is something you want to know about. Um, materials, matter, is something you need to know about. You need to be able to describe what it is you're using. And light is something you need to know about. And in the 50s, when Kahn got serious, really, and you wanted to know about these things in a fundamental way, you had to talk to Einstein. Because he had the best, he had the best description. And so, in it, one of, I mean, Lou had all these sayings um, that he used to try to to synthesize what he was thinking. One was order is, and he believed, like Einstein did, believe that order is the world, universe is ordered. Um, since then, there's been some question whether they were right or not. They may have, quantum physics may have uh, had, have questioned whether the universe is ordered. But at that time, um, Einstein explained what gravity was uh, as a geometric, the curvature of space. Um, and I think in modern, the architect, in modern architecture, the difference was that space became something. If space is curved, if there's something in the curvature of space universally, then space is something. I think up until that time, space wasn't anything. Space was what was not there between walls or Space wasn't. And so the architecture had to do with the facade. But then in the 20th century, based on relativity, space became something. And you, the right was very much analyzed in terms of the space could flow. I mean, space all of a sudden was something like molasses that it flowed around. And in, in uh, Mies van der Rohe's Barcelona Pavilion, space would move and flow, and architects started talking about the flow of space. And so it became an entity. Um, now, I mean, now in, in physics, space has energy. It's not, a, it's, I mean, if it has energy, it has matter, it's not a void. It's not a, even in the vacuum of space. So I think this was a fundamental change. I think Kahn and other architects understood it. Um, Kahn said that matter is spent light. It sounds just like Richard Feynman. It sounds just like quantum mechanics, quantum, uh, quantum, uh, quantum electrodynamics. So he was, I think, trying to make architecture compatible with what seemed in the mid 20th century the best description of how nature was. Um, and I think Einstein, he was here at Princeton many times, he taught at Princeton, he spoke everywhere. I think Einstein's presence and discipline and rigor. Uh, in those years, Einstein was sitting here in Princeton looking for the ultimate unified field theory. I think physics thought he was, other physicists thought he had lost his way, he wasn't really relevant anymore, quantum was going off like this. Um, but um, he was trying to find the final unification of natural laws. And I think Kahn was trying to find the unified field of architecture. And he was trying to present to students a rigorous philosophical basis for architecture. 
It involved space, it involved materials, it involved light. The basic fundamentals. When Kahn talks about a brick wants to be a brick, he's talking about it like it's an electron, like it's a, a, a photon, it's like a photon. It's a fundamental element of architecture. It's not somehow divisible. It's symbolic. I mean, he had concrete and steel and glass and so forth. Um, he made it dis some distinctions. The, up until that time, the, the, the common understanding of architecture was form followed function. It came from Louis Sullivan and Wright was its example. And Kahn modified that and said form evokes function. And from that we understand immediately why ruins and old boiler houses and old factories and old warehouses are immediately reused. Their form their, evokes a new function. And it has, explains also why great buildings survive. Um, and while they, they either get reused or they become great symbols um, as ruins. Enough said. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned modern architecture, and what you just were talking about. What, how do you define modern architecture, and is it different than contemporary architecture? Yeah, modern architecture really was the architecture that began um, when people started to understand what Einstein had been talking about in 1905. The first expression came as cubism. I mean, uh, it, it based on a relativistic theory of, of uh, nature. And it evolved, and the first, and then it gave, it, it, gave a, uh, it, got an, it got a push by the Second World War where European architects like Mies and Corbu wanted to reject the past because it wasn't bomb-proof. So we had to build cities that after the devastation in Europe had to be bomb-proof, and that meant building buildings separate from each other. Um, and it was, it was a, it was, a, it really required denouncing past architecture. We've got to get rid of it, we've got to start fresh. We have steel, we have concrete, we have the automobile. Um, we don't need references to Greek columns and we don't need references to eclectic orders. Let's get that out of our mind. And when, when I went to the University of Pennsylvania in 1954, up until 1952, they taught classic architecture. And so the slate was wiped clean. The faculty was out, and all the new faculty was in. And, you know, I, I, didn't, I couldn't tell Ionic from a Corinthian. I had no idea what that was all about. Um, Khan didn't let that happen. And his attempts were to bring art, archi the history of architecture uh, back into the, the picture. And um, so the, that was what I call modern architecture. Things changed around 1960 or 65 when the implications of quantum mechanics and the uncertainty principle and the probability theory and so forth began to seep into consciousness. So we have postmodernism, which shows a randomness, an accidental quality. Um, and that's where we are now, but we are swinging back in the other direction because somehow we desperately need order and Cosmologists and physicists are desperately trying to concoct a theory called the string theory that will recreate, um, uh, uh, that, will, that, will, that will lead to a unified field theory of everything. So that's where we are. I don't know where, the, where this will take us in architecture of the arts, but it will follow whatever physics does, in my opinion. <laughs> or it will follow an interpretation of whatever. <coughs>
uh, when I went to see the Getty Museum in, in Los Angeles, I was just completely stunned by it because it seemed to be both uh, uh, both ancient and modern simultaneously. It seemed to be both timeless and timely simultaneously. And I got that feeling from some of Kahn's buildings. Do you think that I'm blanking on the architecture of the Getty Richard, right Richard, now. Richard Meyer. Richard Meyer. But do you think that uh, he, Kahn was, he was influenced by Kahn, particularly in the Getty? I, I don't know. I don't know the Getty oh. well enough to talk about it. So, okay, but sorry. was he influenced by Kahn? Yes. <laughs> Unquestionably. David, it, it seemed that the Eastern, um, the buildings he did in the East, in India and in Bangladesh, the appreciation for it was uh, significantly more elevated than, say, yeah. Yeah. us yes. in the West. Yes. Is there something cultural that you would oh, sort of attach to that? <clears throat> In, in, in film, one of the chapters is called Beginnings. Um, Alexandra Ting wrote a wonderful book about Kahn's philosophy called Beginning. Um, Lou sought the beginning. He always went to page zero. He always started everything anew. Always started, you know, go back to the very beginning. And that always took him to the primitive. And I think he found in India and Bangladesh a respect for that primitive quality, that basic, rough, fundamental quality. Uh, I don't agree with, um, I guess, Pei, who said that his buildings were perfect. They were right, but they weren't perfect. He, I don't think he cared that they were perfect or not. And he often said that, you know, The right thing poorly done is better than the wrong thing beautifully done. And I, he sought what was appropriate, what was the most appropriate, what was... And he would test things. Ideas were a dime a dozen. I mean, students would always come... I, I had great sympathy for Nathaniel because nobody got enough face time with Lou. And, and um, everybody came with ideas, hoping that Lou would like the idea. And to Lou, ideas were a dime a dozen. And any idea, he immediately put to the test. Test it, just like a physicist would test. It had to be tested. And on a, on a deeper scale, he would test concepts, or he would test designs by taking things out, by subtracting. And at some point, if you could identify the thing that you took out, that caused the concept to collapse. Then you found the fundamental thing that it needed to be. And that's what he talked about when he talked about, well, when he talked about the brick wants to be a brick, the rose wants to be the rose. It was a sense that these ideas had a desire to come into existence on their own. And it was simply the job of the architect or the artist to recognize them. That's all. <laughs> yes? When you were with Lewis Kahn, did, did he ever express satisfaction with the way a work was complete? Based on the inception, his, his drafting, did, did he have any particular works where he actually felt they, they were executed, they saw it completed, he really felt it worked out the way he wanted it to be, and he was excited, and he said, this really was what I envisioned. And it I, did he feel really good about the piece when it was In terms of when the models went out the door, or when no, the buildings the got The actual in. completion, when he um, could see his work, was there a work that he would Usually by the time the building was finished, it was so many years later, he was on to so many other projects. Um, I can't really answer that, but I don't have the impression that it was a big deal. To see those interior spaces. He knew what. No. I think no, often, no, even in, I, I'm going out on a limb now, but there are no architects here to challenge me, so I will continue. <laughs> um, 
Often, I'm sorry. She, I, I'm voting for her. She's not going to question. Uh, in, as I said before, in many cases, Khan's idea for the building was even more powerful than it could possibly be realized. The extenuating circumstances, those guys who were the con contractors, you know, you know uh, the money, the costs, um, you had to make it 300% to get 100%. So if you made it 100%, you would get 50. I don't think the final building was what Lou was after. Uh, and also, I think the, the projects just, they just flowed into the, into the next project. Uh, he, he never seemed to be upset that the client would say, gee, Lou, it's a little too expensive. Could you redesign it? Okay. Um, I mean, these buildings took years and years. I mean, Bryn Mawr was four years in design. Uh, the client got so upset that they required a weekly meeting, which meant I worked a year on the building. With Ann Ting, as a matter of fact, it meant that well, every week we had to stay up till three or four in the morning to get something to them, which Lou would change anyway. I mean, it was all one building. It was all one design, one architect going on But you don't think that you wanted to see those extraordinary exterior interior spaces, to see the light and the interplay of nature and time of day? I mean, wouldn't you want to see it at actual he's, home? He, I, he saw I it think before he, the answer. He saw it before he... I made, I made great models. He could see them in the model. <laughs> <laughs> Get in with a light. You see. Um, I don't know. I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't think of... Uh, have ever, have ever. I, I really think that once the drawings and the models are, he went to the site and completed and people went and completed, but he had gone, he was now, he was, he was going beyond. And, but I think to a certain extent, it was all the same building. I mean, if you look at a lot of the buildings, the center space, light coming from above. Um, are there any residential buildings other than the Fisher House that was highlighted that you are aware of that undiscovered someplace? No, they're not undiscovered. There are a few. He always tried to have a little house going. Uh, somehow he liked that. Uh, the Eschrick House outside of Philadelphia was built for a, an incredible craftsman who did a lot of the, the interior woodworking. Um, I can't remember all the house, but there are there are a number, and of course before earlier, um, before the fifties, Lou uh, did a lot of public housing. Uh, it's not necessarily distinguished, but it's. I mean, anybody know Roosevelt, New Jersey? Well, that was a WPA project. He worked on that. Um, so. Um, What? No, for me, for many years, Esther carried the office, but he was in financial difficulty because these buildings got redesigned time after time after time. Many projects were started and actually done, and then dropped for one reason or the other. Uh, the 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 um, the Mellon Museum at Yale, the, the um, Museum of British Art. Um, one of Lou's great clients, Paul Getty, uh, Paul Mellon, uh, was a devoted client. But the building came in at 15 million, and Paul figured 12 was good enough, so Lou redesigned the building. But he still, you know, I mean, it, it just never could keep up. And I think Bangladesh was probably, Pakistan and Bangladesh was what really bankrupted him because most of it was owed to the engineers. The HVAC guys and the lighting guys and structural engineers. And, and he, and then he would go off and do a, a, a huge project for Venice that didn't get built. He never got paid. And so that was, he was on to the next thing. 
He wasn't a businessman. No. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't even come close. <laughs> Do you know what the son's livelihood is? Excuse me? Do you know what the son's livelihood is? Fan. He's a fabulous filmmaker. I think he was a playwright. Is that, is that I don't. I don't know if he's what he's working on or what he's doing. Casey, you know. He's working on a second film. Is he? Is he? Well, I think that the sequel should be the philosophy of Lucan's philosophy, architectural philosophy. Um, if he could do that, if somebody could do that, the film doesn't do it really. Did you do that? David, you had mentioned that um, C.K. was also um, influenced yeah. by um, your um, studies with um, Khan at U of P. And I wonder if you could talk at all about how it influenced your poetry. Um, I didn't really study with him. I sort of hung around with him. They worked in the office of another friend of ours, Ricky, and I knew McAllister. And I was just sort of in his circle. He liked me because I was the only one who ever disagreed with him. <laughs> All the architects would say, yes, yes, yes. And I'd say, Lou, what do you mean? And he liked that. Um, but when I, somebody asked me to write an essay about um, what had influenced me, this was about 20 years ago, in my artistic life. And when I began to think about it, I realized that he had been the big influence of my life, uh, mainly um, in this in incredible patience he had, which Dave has just described, that you know, the buildings, the, the, the plant, the design went on and on and on, and the giving of his life to the work was really very, very important to me. Some people would say that that's procrastination. <laughs> No, that's not. An artist wouldn't say that. It's not procrastination. It's, I mean, he really taught the big lesson for me was patience. That that's what you have to have. You have to be infinitely patient. And then I have an anecdote about him that's my, one of my favorite self-anecdotes. I had this brilliant idea that why don't you build houses with the closets and dressers on the outside, you know, so that the, there'd be a flat wall and you'd open the closet door and the door would be out, you know, like a brick thing. So I went to Lou, you were talking about, I gave, came with my idea. And he said, Charlie, for a poet, you're awfully literal. <laughs> Desperate, yes, all the time, and you desperately try to move on. It's not easy. Half the time you are discarding things because they look too much like Khan might have influenced you. <laughs> what did you say? Charlie told me a story about uh, somebody worked in Moore's office. Yeah, this is a story someone told me this week. Dave called while I was sitting with this fan. Um, and he told me about his first lover was um, an architect who worked for Charles Moore. He studied with Charles Moore, and then he worked and worked in his office, and Charles Moore was his whole life. And they were living, he and his partner were um, house-sitting at Charles Moore House. And this guy woke up in the middle of the night, this architect, and he said, all Charles Moore is Lou Kahn with decoration. <laughs> and he really, his, he had a, a, in the, the middle of his night, his whole life changed. He left Moore, he left my friend too, actually. And apparently he had sort of an architectural nervous breakdown. <laughs> admitted them or he talked about them. Some he did and some he didn't. And some <clears throat> I could just surmise without knowing for sure. Uh, he would, the, uh, the Pantheon in Rome, of course, was 
the ultimate uh, influence. Here is a building, set light coming in from above, uh, one of humankind's basic uh, archetypes of religion, uh, dedicated to all religions, built out of brick. You know, as my my favorite uh, my fa favorite reggae um, singer, uh, Burning Spear, says. It's the one ting ting man. <laughs> and I think you know, that was basic to Khan. Um, he had huge Piranesi drawing of um, an imaginary Rome of Hadrian's time on the wall. Um, there were there were there were buildings that symbolized what he was after. He didn't copy them, but they were there. And I mean, if you look at many of the buildings, um, the, the Bryn Mawr dormitories, three buildings, all the light is coming from above. Dhaka, the light pours in from above. The synagogues, the light pours in from above. Uh, the Unitarian Church in Rochester, the light pours in from above. These are all from the, the Pantheon in Rome. Um, he, I think, uh, was one of the first in architecture and sculpture, maybe even in painting, to absorb what Feynman was saying in quantum electrodynamics, that light is not reflected. Light is readmitted. So matter emits light. And I think that that suggested a vitality to surfaces and a vitality to, to materials that Kahn tried to incorporate. It's a subtle thing, but it was... And so that how light, how natural light... I mean, the first... Um, what distinguishes... Um, um, what distinguishes the Mellon Art Gallery? What distinguishes... Um, the Kimball Gallery, natural light. This is taboo. I mean, the Guggenheim made a big deal. Frank Gehry's new Guggenheim Museum, how the Guggenheim... Well, Wright's building, is to the, the, the skylights are still obscured. The entire Guggenheim has skylights going around the surfaces where the painting is to be hung. The first curator blocked them out. No way, no natural light. Modern art needs artificial light. So Khan brought natural light back into these museums. I mean, Museum in Glasgow has wonderful natural light all over the place. Uh, but in this country it wasn't, or in a lot of galleries. And, and you, still, you can still go into the new modern, you know, it's white walls, the new, the new modern museum, the main entry gallery Still white walls with artificial light. The Monet looks like a disaster. So, those were those were influences. Uh, I think uh, Lou was competitive. I, I think Stern was right in one regard. Lou was competitive. Uh, Saarinen built a dormitory at the University of Pennsylvania, and Lou built one at Bryn Mawr, and I think. <laughs> He, he challenged the Saarinen dorm in the way he built Bryn Mawr. I think he was definitely aware of that. I think there were other influences like Vassarelli, the painter, uh, who showed geometric shapes and forms. And I think for, for Kahn, the most fundamental basic choice he could make was deciding whether the circle was appropriate or the square or the triangle. He... Uh, his definition of architecture was the thoughtful making of spaces. Okay. That meant what was space, which we've discussed before. Making. Um, the space had to be made. As Jack McAllister was saying, well, you wanted to show the accidents. No, you wanted to show how the space was made. And that's why the Trenton 
little bathhouse is so critical because here are the all the elements of it, its construction are the final elements. Uh, it has one other thing of dividing the servant spaces to from the using spaces because Khan. I, I will add this little aside. Uh, like Einstein, Khan was a very very practical person. Maybe he was a visionary, maybe he was a philosopher, maybe he was a poet. He was also a very, very practical person. He was a builder, and he was solving and trying to solve very, very basic, practical building questions. Just like Einstein looked out of his patent office window and saw clocks on the railroad and wondered, how the heck can we synchronize clocks all over Switzerland when we can't communicate faster than the speed of light, from which came the theory of relativity. Okay. So Kahn was solving basic problems. The ducts and the, the pipes and the wires are killing the space. How can you, you can't have, you can't have drop ceilings, you can't have false floors, because they, you can't, Show, you, you can't show the making of the space. You can't have partitions. How can you partition the Pantheon? <laughs> and so you see in his plans, the buildings are many, many buildings. Trenton was four little buildings. Bryn Mawr is three buildings. Right? Um, because you had to make each space a building if you really wanted to know how it was made. Well, it meant knowing the structure, knowing the supports, where is gravity taken, what's the strength of the materials, how are the materials made, how are they formed. All this had to be revealed. Partitioning was a real problem, serious problem. And he tried to avoid it in, in all kinds of ways. Um, the um, if you made each space a building, then connecting the buildings becomes an encumbrance. So he had to invent an architecture of connection, which didn't work. Except at Bryn Mawr, he just let the buildings touch at the corners, hoping that you could still distinguish the separate buildings. These are all absolutely basic geometric solutions, or attempts at geometric solutions. Was he ever happy with it? It never really, it never really got pure enough, except once. And that was the, the FDR memorial uh, that he designed for Welfare Island, which was right in front of the UN. There's an attempt to maybe get that built, uh, but Parks Department is going to put a little playground in instead. Um, Lou tried to synthesize the thoughtful making of spaces to what is the fundamental space of architecture. It was just a simple room without a roof, without a ceiling, in which Roosevelt sat, just a certain proportion right, at the end of the island, looking at New York. Um, he didn't build it. Uh, Halpern knocked it off and built it in Washington. Sorry, I must say, he built four of them instead of one. But that was Lou's attempt to really make the most fundamental architectural um, building or space. some questions. And one of the questions is, how'd your mother like it? The film. And he says, well, she's here. Ask her. So she stood up to answer and everybody applauded. So he said, I think she liked it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
personal dimension to the film. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, as you know, this is 